Good morning, Mr. Pretorius. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, DCJ. Chair, um, mm. I believe you yes, need to deal with certain we, issues before we begin. Yes, before we proceed with uh, today's business, I just want to deal with a matter that uh, has quite correctly attracted the attention of the public and the media uh, a lot. Previously, I determined that today up to Friday would be the week when the former president, Mr. Jacob Zuma, would appear before this commission. He was notified thereof, and after some time, his attorneys wrote to the commission and said that he would not be appearing before this commission during this week. The reasons they gave include that he was busy preparing for his criminal trial, that his uh, doctors have advised him to limit his movements because of his age and COVID-19, and that he is, he was seeking legal advice on the implications of the recent amendments to the regulations of this commission. I do not want to comment at this stage on his reasons uh, for deciding that he would not appear before this commission this week. The media have sent a number of inquiries with regard to him, including a question such as whether this commission will issue a subpoena to compel him to appear before it, and whether there are other dates which have been determined when he should appear. Since his attorneys informed the Commission that he would not be appearing this week, in order for the Commission to use its time optimally, arrangements were made for the matter, the matter that we are going to hear this week to be heard this week. This was a matter that was going to be heard later in the year. So the Commission had to rearrange its plans so that we could use this week properly, which otherwise would be wasted. I decided after receiving, the Commission had received his response through his attorneys to fix the date for the hearing of the Commission Legal team, Team's application for an order authorizing the issuing of a summons against Mr. Zuma. I have determined that that date will be the 9th of October at 9 a.m. He and his lawyers have been informed that unless I'm satisfied on that date that there are good grounds for them not to appear, if they do not appear, that application will proceed without them. They have been informed that should they wish to make use of a virtual appearance before the Commission, and if they inform the Commission timelessly, arrangements will be made for them to appear virtually before the Commission. 
but that application will proceed with or without them unless I'm satisfied that there are good grounds for them not to be here. I have also determined new dates for Mr. Zuma's appearance before the Commission. Since becoming aware of the letter from his attorneys, those dates are 16 to 20 November 2020. Those are the dates that I have determined. I know that in their letter, they, his attorneys said dates should be negotiated with him or with them. No dates will be negotiated with them or with, they, with him. This commission has made it clear to the attorneys who represented him before that this commission does not negotiate dates with witnesses. The commission fixes the dates and people are supposed to appear and if they've got good grounds for not appearing, then they make an application, uh, a necessary application and show that they've got good grounds. And if I'm satisfied that there are good grounds, other dates will be determined. But we will not negotiate dates with witnesses. So the position as it stands is the application brought by the legal team of the commission for the authorization of a summons, the issuing of a summons against Mr. Zuma will proceed on the 9th of October at 9 o'clock and the dates of 16 to 20 November 2020 have been determined for his appearance. That is all I wanted to say about that matter. Now we, we may proceed. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the evidence contemplated for this week concerns matters related to the departments um, in the free state dealing with housing and in particular a series of events that took place during 2010 and 2011 concerning certain prepayments uh, over half a billion rand made to suppliers um, in order to avoid forfeiting funds uh, to the fiscus, uh, what has been described as a fraudulent scheme of payments to suppliers causing great prejudice and loss to the department. And that really is the focus of the evidence this week. Now, Chair, the witnesses who will testify will firstly be uh, Mr. McKetsy, who came onto the scene later than the relevant period, but brought an application on behalf of the department for the department to review its own decisions. And that application summarizes most of the relevant facts which are common cause between um, a number of parties. Not all the parties, but the relevant parties. And Mr. McKetsy will take you through the uh, events chair to deal with the matters. Um, Mr. McQuenna uh, was the head of department at the time. He will testify to certain issues. And then a Mr. Makachwa will also testify in relation to certain issues. But Chair, there have been a number of reports and investigations into this matter. The Special Investigations Union uh, Unit have uh, dealt with the matter. Uh, there have been forensic reports, a number of forensic reports, and there has been, of course, the application brought by the department, which involved a great deal of uh, research into the events that happened. There was also a very, very thorough um, disciplinary inquiry, which is the focus of certain um, factual investigations that have been 
conducted for that purpose, uh, and that too uh, is a matter of record. So, Chair, it's not the intention of uh, the evidence leaders in this matter to rehash all those investigations. It would be a matter of repetition. But what we would like to do with your leave, Chair, is focus on two issues. One is the issue of accountability. Who was held accountable for what happened, and why were certain people not held accountable? That will be uh, the first focus. The second focus would be to show that this prepayment scheme to suppliers that was devised in order to allow the um, department to spend over a half a billion rand for little or no value under a f what has been termed by the court uh, in the application as a fraudulent scheme is took place within a context, and that context was an entirely irregular background uh, of uh, irregularities in relation to procurement. From the start in 2010, matters went wrong, or deliberately were caused to go wrong in an entirely irregular scheme, and that is that context in the housing uh, housing settlements, uh, human settlements department will be placed before you. Those two issues, important as they are, seem to have really escaped uh, notice. And whilst it is important to tell the whole story uh, for the purposes of the commission, which we will do, uh, it is those two issues upon which we will focus. Chair, there are a number of bundles that have been prepared they contain the statements of nine witnesses, not necessary to deal with the evidence of all nine witnesses, as, as will become apparent. There is a file containing transcripts uh, of the interviews with uh, certain uh, of the witnesses. Then there's a file which deals with the court proceedings and contains the judgment uh, of a full bench of the Free State Division. Then there is a file containing a number of forensic reports, uh, which it is not necessary to detail, but we will refer to certain aspects of those forensic reports. There's a file containing the relevant legislation and prescripts. And then importantly, uh, there's a file which contains the disciplinary records the full disciplinary record, which is there then, for, and the findings, 177 pages of findings, uh, parts of which we will rely on as well, Chair, um, to complete uh, the picture, which would otherwise not be complete. That, those records are before you for purposes of the commission, submissions, your findings, Chair, and any other purpose to which they may be put in due course. And then similarly to the asbestos matter, Chair, we have together with the investigators compiled an investigator's report, which sets out from beginning to end all the detailed facts, which is there as a matter of record, again for submissions and the final report. It's supported by documentary evidence, uh, and again it is not necessary to go through that. So Chair, if by your leave I can just deal with a few uh, matters by way of opening, and then summarize uh, the important uh, events to which reference will be made in evidence, and then if we may deal with the evidence of Mr. McKetsy, who brought the application on behalf of the department for the department to review its own decisions in relation to the prepayments. That's in order. Chair, there were two applications, or perhaps still are two applications for cross-examination uh, of Mr. McQuenna. Mr. McQuenna, the HOD at the time, uh, in his statement made certain allegations concerning a Mr. McClatra and a Mr. Colloy. They both filed applications for cross-examination, but after correspondence with the attorneys and given the evidence that is to be led, they've put those applications on hold. Uh, so it is not necessary to deal with them at this stage, and 
they will in all probability not be proceeded with. I've dealt with the bundles and documentation that is before you, uh, and I've dealt with uh, what we will focus on um, in opening and in the evidence. The three witnesses have been uh, named, and then a Mr. Zwani, um, who in a sense devised the scheme, the evidence will be, but was apparently, and I stress the word apparently, not held accountable for any of the outcomes of that scheme and its illegality, manifest illegality, uh, will be asked to uh, explain uh, his position in relation to that. In essence, what happened here is a number of junior employees were disciplined. And I say junior with respect, they, they were not mere functionaries, they were officials of some seniority. But the people who were ultimately responsible for the scheme and its implementation, uh, no consequences followed. Chair, the, the background is important because it is important to understand the impropriety of the prepayment scheme within its proper context. In 2010-2011, there were actually regular contracts entered into with contractors. And at a stage during that financial year, the normal properly procured contracts were ready to be implemented. Then there came a change. Uh, the Premier at the time, Mr. Mahashule, decided that there would be a change in the whole system. Bigger houses would be built. Disputes arose with the contractors and a new tender process had to be commenced. A new tender process was indeed commenced during the 2010 20 uh, 11 financial year. But what happened was that by the time the bid adjudication committee came to consider the bids, the period of validity of the tenders had expired. Instead of regularizing the position by extending the validity of the period or the period of validity of the tenders, instead of simply regularizing that, and there are various ways that are required to do that, it was just abandoned. The, those who qualified in terms of the bids, those who were disqualified, including those who were declared incompetent to build, were all put on a database. And that database, certain officials, including Mr. Zwani, the evidence will be, merely selected who they wanted uh, to, be, to, um, to do the work. So the contractors that were appointed uh, during this whole process to receive goods from the suppliers, which uh, accounts were prepaid, were there irregularly in the first place. Instead of going through a proper tender process, the relevant department simply abandoned the process, threw it overboard, and put qualified, disqualified uh, on a database, and then just subjectively selected who they wanted to appoint. Huge contracts, 500,000 houses um, in municipalities in the Free State. So in the original process, Chair, 361 bids were received. 105 were disqualified for basic bid compliance reasons. Not properly registered, no tax returns, or other formal reasons, but important reasons. 147 were disqualified because they did not meet the minimum functionality threshold. In other words, weren't competent to do the work. There were 109 who qualified, 81 established contractors and 28 emerging contractors. That was the situation when 
the whole bidding process was thrown overboard uh, because of an expiry of the validity period. So instead of reinstating the process, and there are ways to do that which will, will be dealt with, Chair, um, all those qualified and disqualified were put onto a database and then at the discretion of officials, subjective discretion of officials, people were um, pointed to do work. Of course, this had alarming consequences at the end, which is the subject matter of reports. Contractors simply couldn't do the work. They walked off site, uh, monies disappeared, and all that is the subject of investigation in due course. And of course, putting the service providers on the database implies that as far as the department is, is concerned, they can be given jobs. Correct. So it opens the door mm. for subjective allocation of work yeah, at the discretion of an official. In, and if you put onto the database uh, service providers that have been found to be incom not competent to do the job, it means you, you, you could be giving jobs to service providers who are not competent to do the job. It's exactly what happened, Chair. Yes. In fact, the outcome uh, of this whole process began here. Mm. Uh, it was disastrous for those people in the free state who needed housing, mm. low-cost housing. Mm. There was a huge national project, project for mm. the development of mm. low-cost housing. Originally, and in its conception, uh, quite ironically, it was designed to avoid mismanagement and corruption, but that's precisely what happened in the free mm. state. Mm. So the first, in the 2010-2011 year, the first issue that has really not received much attention was that the foundations, um, well, there weren't very many foundations, <laughs> Uh, at the end of the day, but the foundation of the project, the housing project, was fraught with irregularities. Mm. Um, quite simply, uh, a whole lot of qualified, disqualified people were put on a database, and from that database, people were then selected subjectively at the instance of particular officials. Mm. Mm. The detail of how the matter should have been regularized uh, will be dealt with in evidence uh, here, but for the moment, um, suffice it to say that it was not a lawful option simply to abandon the process, simply because a particular time period had expired. We will deal with the regulatory framework governing uh, both the appointment of contractors on the one hand and suppliers to contractors on the other. But what is clear from the start here is neither contractors nor suppliers of, of materials to contractors were subject to any competitive bidding process, um, which uh, as we've dealt with in the asbestos matter is clearly unlawful and inexcusable. So we will deal with uh, Section 217 of the Constitution. We will deal with the Public Finance Management Act provisions, the Treasury regulations, and we will deal with the Division of Revenue Act. This money that was allocated by the National Fiscus to the Free State for the construction of houses was allocated in terms of an act uh, colloquially called DORA, the Division of Revenue Act. And that act is quite explicit. It says that we are going to allocate money to the province for a particular express purpose, in this case the construction of low-cost housing. The act is very clear that if any of that money is to be paid to third parties, such as contractors or suppliers, it has to be done in terms of a regular procurement process, uh, open bidding process, which complies with the supply chain management pro uh, requirements of the province. 
that did, simply did not happen. That fact, uh, it's clear, was concealed uh, from national. So not only must goods be procured or services be procured uh, from third parties in accordance with supply chain management policy or procurement policy of the relevant province, uh, and for which adequate documentation for payment has been received. So, not only that, but the, the purpose must be complied with. So, it's only for housing in terms of the Act and in accordance with proper procedures. But then there's a third provision which is important in this case. It says you can't make advance payments to anybody. You have to have received the goods or the services have to have been verified and done uh, before you pay money out, for obvious reasons, uh, to avoid precisely what happened in the province. That can only happen in two circumstances, according to Dora. The first is if the receiving officer in the free state who receives the money has certified to the National Treasury that the transfer is not an attempt to artificially inflate its spending estimates and that there are good reasons for the advance payment or transfer. That, it's clear on the department's own version subsequently, was precisely the purpose. Uh, what happened was that by, towards the end of the financial year, the Free State had not spent over a billion rand of its income and had to devise a fraudulent scheme, well, a scheme which turned out to be fraudulent, in order to spend that money. And all sorts of mechanisms were devised to ensure that that money could be spent. Completely irregular uh, schemes, and that, will be, uh, that story will be told and placed before you. But the second thing is that National Treasury must approve the advance payment. It didn't. And in fact, it was told something completely different, and that, uh, that evidence will be placed before you. So the scheme that was devised, chaired by the Free State uh, Human Settlements Department, in order to spend the money before the year end, otherwise the money goes back uh, to Treasury, um, was devised at the highest level. It was devised at the level of the MEC in a war room, Mr. Zwani. He devised it and executed it, and that war room supervised the execution of the scheme, the detail of which will become clear in the evidence of Mr. McKetsy. Not only did they devise it, but they ignored warnings from National that this was illegal and should not be proceeded with. And notwithstanding those warnings, um, the scheme was in fact proceeded with. The matter was done without proper legal advice being taken, um, perhaps for obvious reasons, because the, the advice had already been given by National that the scheme was illegal, and on the face of it was manifestly illegal. There are various elements of the scheme that will emerge in evidence. Not only were payments made to suppliers before goods were even supplied, but payments were made to suppliers and then on paid to contractors as so-called bridging finance, which is not the business of the Human Settlements Department at all. And then, in addition, in order to ensure that as much money was spent as fast as possible, retainer agreements, retentions which would be kept back by the department to uh, compensate for work poorly done or work not done, um, those rights were abandoned entirely. So even the retainer amounts were paid out prematurely. Of course, that had serious consequences because as matters turned out, uh, the, the result was all but hopeless and that retention money was needed. But that had been foregone to ensure expenditure and the detail of that will be put before you. 
The, the agreements that were entered into as part of the scheme, which the court found to be a fraudulent scheme, are quite complicated, but we will do our best to explain them so that they are accessible to those who have an interest in following it. But essentially, there were three levels of contract. The first is the contract with the construction uh, entity, the builder. That contract with the builder was clear in its terms, was uh, on the face of it regular insofar as the contents of the contract are concerned. We've already said that the selection was entirely irregular. But once the contract was entered into, the, it was the duty of the contractor to source the materials, to pay for the materials, to put the materials into the building, and then on three milestones being achieved, would invoice the department and the department would pay the contractors. So the contract in itself was, on the face of it, quite regular. But in order to spend the money before the year end, because of course these buildings would only be constructed and these milestones would only be reached in the next financial year, but the money had to be spent in the 2010-2011 year, a scheme was devised to pay suppliers up front, even before goods were delivered to the builders. <laughs> so, the scheme was devised to pay the suppliers sums of money. With that money, the suppliers not only paid bridge quote-unquote bridging finance to the contractors, which was not the business of the Housing Settlements mm. Department at all, mm. but the, um, the suppliers would enter into uh, agreements with the department to, to receive monies and eventually to deliver goods. But those were all prepayments. Mm. 600 million rand share was spent in, in, in this that way. Uh, fraudulent way. But the whole idea was to, to uh, avoid a situation where by the end of the financial year, the department had not used uh, this money for housing. Yes. So there had to be a scheme had to be ar arranged in terms of which it would appear as if they had used the money properly, properly. for housing, yes. but actually they had not used the money properly. Correct. And yeah. that was the essence of the fraud found by the mm -hmm. High Court. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the question is, who was accountable for that? And how did accountability follow for that? that is, the, the facts um, which I've just related, Chair, are in a sense common cause. Mr. McKessie uh, was the deponent to the founding affidavit where these facts were placed before the court. And uh, they are fully set out and we'll go through them in some detail and uh, try and unravel them. Uh, they, they're quite elaborate in some ways, but uh, quite clumsy uh, in other ways. So, for example, in order to um, make this appear regular and in order to provide documentation to the provincial treasury on which monies could pay out, there, there was a scheme um, that took some time to, for, for the legal team to understand, uh, let alone communicate sensibly to anybody else, Chair, which I'll attempt to do, of sessions um, entered into. So what there had to be a paper trail which were, were could, those the sessions spelt with an S E S S I N O N. Yes. <laughs> yes, and sometimes it is spelt with a C, but you will see, Chair, that right <laughs> until the end there was spelt with an S. And that's I suppose not to give them the the qualification of a, of a real session. Yeah. But you will recall, Chair, that uh, we pointed out that the, any claim 
by the builder against the department would only arise once a milestone was reached, which would probably be in the following financial year. But what the scheme was devised whereby that claim against the department for materials as part of the work was ceded to the supplier. Of course, there was no such claim upon which the supplier then, as part of the prepayment scheme, uh, invoiced the department and got paid its money. And of course, uh, even further, quite ironically, of course, there would be no claim because the supplier had already been paid by the time the session uh, came to operate. But it's complicated, and I'll try and explain it uh, uh, properly in due course. But that whole scheme of sessions was the third layer of uh, agreements, which were entirely um, nonsensical in a way. Then, of course, Chair, there, um, there were two other methods devised for getting rid of money quickly. The Free State Housing Settlement Department became involved in the, in the job of bridging finance. And it emerged in the investigations that what the suppliers were doing with the money they received is they were handing it on to the builders before anything had happened. Uh, as part of bridging finance. That is dealt with in a certain way, and I will deal with it with Mr. McKessie, who describes that whole scheme as quite frankly bizarre uh, and uses those particular words. Um, and then, of course, the abandonment of the right of retention. If the department has got 5% of all the expenditure uh, on construction, um, it needs that money, and particularly needed in this case to remedy defects, but decided because we need to spend this money, we're going to pay that money out and not rely on the retention. So that money was also part of the scheme. Uh, that doesn't arise out of the application. That came out of further investigations, but that will be dealt with. It was dealt with in the disciplinary inquiries. So, Chair... There are a number of investigations, too, that have taken place. Um, the Commission simply would not have the capacity to go into hundreds and hundreds of individual contracts to show why those particular persons uh, benefited uh, on an irregular and unlawful basis from the distribution of monies in haste during the 2010-2011 financial year. But we will highlight some matters which have been highlighted in the investigations and which require further investigation. And uh, Mr. McPatchua will give evidence in relation to certain of the matters uh, that concerned him. He was, in fact, uh, relatively low down in the seniority hierarchy, but he was one of the people that were dismissed. Stated, Chair, that there, quite interestingly, and perhaps a matter of concern in itself, were there was an overdose of forensic reports in this matter. The Auditor General, quite properly of course, conducted its investigation and report. There was an entity called Open Waters Advanced Risk Solutions that was employed to conduct forensic audits. The Special Investigations Unit did its own. Nurture, N-U-R-C-H-A, Finance Company Limited, did an extensive investigation as well. And the outcome of all that uh, has yet to be realized. Uh, that in itself is a matter of concern. How matters are investigated, who is appointed to investigate matters, and what is the outcome of that. And we will deal with that uh, in submissions. So, Chair, that is a very brief overview of the evidence that uh, will be led. And um, if we may take you 
through the application that was brought subsequently to that uh, series of events by the department itself, and uh, Mr. McKessie will hopefully help us in that regard. Okay. No, that's fine. Uh, does that mean he is ready to be sworn in? Yes, please. Yes, before that is done, I didn't deal earlier on with a matter that I should have dealt with when I responded to some media queries with regard to Mr. Zuma. I think the media queries at different times have been about his appearance before the Commission, but also about uh, the fact that uh, he has not filed any affidavits before the Commission uh, to help the Commission and to put his side of the story. I didn't deal with the last part. I just want to deal with that immediately because it is in the public interest that the public knows what is happening, particularly about somebody who was president of the country. And uh, um, I just want to say that uh, towards the end of August, I issued a directive in terms of Regulation 10.6, that is 10 sub-Regulation 6 of the regulations of this Commission, compelling Mr. Zuma to depose to an affidavit or an affirmed declaration to answer certain matters relating to ESCOM um, with special reference to or the affidavit submitted by Mr. Zola Tzotzi, who was chairperson of the of ESCOM at some stage, as well as the affidavit of Mr. Nick Linnell, with regard to particularly a meeting that they both said had been held in Mr. Zuma's official residence in Durban, where, according to them, a discussion relating to the removal of certain executives at ESCOM was discussed, or a discussion took place relating to the removal or suspension of certain executives. That was towards the end of August, and um, I have also issued another 10-6 directive uh, against Mrs. Zuma in regard to another matter. The Commission might not uh, compel him to respond to all the affidavits that uh, have been filed, but certainly there are certain affidavits that the Commission uh, believes are very important for him to deal with, and uh, in regard to those, as the legal team makes a request uh, for me to issue uh, directives to him to submit affidavits, I will consider those requests and make a decision on the basis of each uh, application or request. I thought I must just uh, add that because I didn't deal with it earlier on, it, and it's a matter that the public has an interest on. Yes. Uh. Thank you, Chair. Chair, before proceeding with the evidence of Mr. McKetsy, Mm. Uh, he is legally represented. May his counsel place himself on record? Oh, yes, sure. May it please you, Chairperson. I appear on behalf of Mr. Mukhezi, together with my learned junior, Mr. Manye, instructed by Ms. Babani Maranyani of the State Attorney at Bloemfontein. Uh, thank we you. understand he's merely a witness, and I doubt that you'll hear from me again yes. in this matter. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, okay, administer the oath uh, or affirmation, please. Please state your full names for the record. Timo Samuches. Do you have any objections to taking the prescribed oath? No, I don't. Do you consider the oath to be binding on your conscience? Yes, I do. Do you swear that the evidence will give will be the truth, 
the whole truth and nothing else but the truth. If so, please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. Thank you. You may be seated, Mr. Kretzi. Morning, Mr. Mukherjee. Morning. Um, Mr. We are Mukherjee. happy that you are back, Mr. Mukherjee. Yes. Um, Mr. Pretorius, are you only going to deal with the housing matter in regard to him at this stage and deal with the remainder of his evidence relating to the asbestos matter on another day? Uh, yes, Chair, that is the intention. Both? Mr. Mpufu did appear this morning. Um, in the expectation that Mr. McKetsy would also be dealing with uh, asbestos matters. Um, unfortunately, in our preparations, we weren't uh, in a position to deal with both matters today, and alternative arrangements will then be made um, uh, in consultation with uh, Mr. Mpofu, the attorneys, and Mr. McKetsy. But uh, I can give Mr. McKetsy the assurance that 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 period of questioning will be very short. And it yes. could take place either on Monday or Tuesday next week. Yes. Um, all parties willing or even other arrangements could be made. Yes, well, you, you just said in consultation with Mr. Mpofu. Yes. Uh, After consultation <laughs> when, with Mr. When, Mpofu. when I've just said that we don't negotiate dates with lawyers and yes. their cli witnesses and their clients. <laughs> Yes. Okay, all right. Although, although um, if it's short notice, if it's short notice, we can talk because it's short notice. But if it's reasonable notice, uh, we, we, there is yes, no need. Sure. Unfortunately, we did inconvenience Mr. Mpofu. Yeah, um, <laughs> but um, yes. that, yeah. that okay, can be right. sorted out in the spirit of collegiality, and uh, it will be after consultation. Yeah. Well, as I say, if we, if they are given reasonable notice. There is no need, but if you seek to have short notice, then it's, yes. it's understandable because they would complain of short notice. But if they are given reasonable notice, then uh, there is no need yes. because otherwise we'd never get anything done if we've got to negotiate dates with lawyers and witnesses. I understand, Chair. Yeah. And, um... But uh, uh, Mr. Mukherjee's other evidence should be dealt with... Uh, uh, pretty soon. Yes, it will yeah. be, Chair. Yeah. It must be, and if I think all that at least is common. Next week, if at all possible, yes. but uh, you will have a look. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> Mr. McKenzie, there is a file FS14. Is that the file in front of you? Yes, it's a FS14. Uh, this this file, Mr. Pretorius, I guess, should be marked bundle FS14. Is your... Or not? Yes, it should be. Um, yeah. That is the file marked court proceedings. Sorry? Is that the file marked court yeah. proceedings? Yeah. Um, it should be. If it hasn't, that was part of the of flurry the of activity yeah. this morning. Yeah. Okay. Bundle. It will be referred to as bundle FS14. That's the uh, file marked court proceeding, proceedings, Exhibit UU11. Thank you, Chair. I understand, and there's no dispute about this, um, Mr. McKenzie, that during 2013, the Free State Department of Human Settlements brought an application before the High Court in Bloemfontein to review and set aside certain contracts that had been entered into with a number of suppliers. In fact, 106 of them. Yes. And you were instrumental in doing the necessary investigation uh, and research, uh, reading the necessary documentation in preparing the papers for that application. Yes, sir. If you would please go to page 95, you will see, Mr. McKetsy, and 
uh, you're fortunately an old hand at this, that there are two numbers, two sets of numbers at the top of each page. We will be dealing with the black numbers in the top left-hand corner. Yes, I'm on page 95. So, now, that is a founding affidavit. Um, if you would go to page 173, please. At the bottom of that page, whose signature is that? Yeah, that's my signature. Is that the founding affidavit then that was brought during these court proceedings attested to you, attested to by yourself? Yes. And it appears from page 95 to page 174. Yes, yeah, that's the one. The one. notice of motion... appears before that after divider 2 one can ignore the summons proceedings in the first divider but if it, one could go to page 60.1 please yes I'm on 60.1 and that was the application to review and set aside the agreements with suppliers listed as respondents, 106 of them, and to set aside the decisions made by the Free State Department of Human Settlements to make the payments listed in Annexure 3 to the notice. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Right. I'm sorry, Mr. Pujas, yes. did you say page 60 point something? Yes. 60.1? Yes, sure. Uh, it doesn't look like I've got 60.1. I've got 61. Uh, and at 61 is the list of respondents. That's Anisha 1 to the notice of motion. All right, sure. Um, may, may I, there is a divider marked 2. Yes. A, a cardboard divider. Yeah. The first page after that divider, may I ask what page? 61. 61? Mm. It's supposed to be 60.1. 60.1. Is it 60.1 or 61? It is 61. Well, then it's the incorrect page. Jim, perhaps this is a... A convenient time. If I may run for cover yeah. uh, and <laughs> return after the short adjournment. Okay, all right. Let's take the tea adjournment and we'll give you a chance to... Have this attended to. Thank we you. Are Jim. All rise.
both hands.
Okay, it looks like the pagination has been corrected. Yes, for the present. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> yes, okay. Let's continue then. If you would go to page 60.1, please, Mr. McKerty, of FS14. Yeah, I'm on page 60.1. That's the notice of motion preceding the I'm affidavit sorry. to which I'm, we've I'm just sorry, referred Mr. the Pretorius. chair. I'm sorry, Mr. Pretorius. There is quite some noise, I think, from the aircon, which wasn't there before. T at least I didn't notice it. Uh, it looks like quite lo it's loud. Um, did anybody ask for it to be put on? I did. Oh, you did? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it can be put off. It, we were warned that it would be noisy. Yes, um, it seems quite... I don't know if there's a way of reducing the, the sound the, so that it's yes. not too noisy. I think somebody will look at that. Uh, okay, all right. Yes, thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, otherwise, we could just have it on during the breaks. Yes. That, that might be a way of solving the yes. problem, but it is pretty hot yeah. down here. Yeah, no, that, that, that's fine. We'll just have to see how we strike the balance. Uh, I don't want you to feel too hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, all right. I think they have reduced it. That should be fine. Thank you, Chair. Mm. Mr. McKissie, that is the notice of motion about which uh, we've been speaking, is that correct? Yes. And it seeks to set aside certain agreements with persons listed in the annexure of 106 uh, contracting parties, and it also seeks to set aside decisions of the Free State Department of Human Settlements to make payments in terms of those agreements. Is that yes. correct? Um, the date of that notice of motion, I did refer to a document dated 2013, but uh, this application was brought, as I understand it, in 2016. Yes. Some years after the events in question, which took place in 2010 and 2011. Yes. If one could go, please, to... FS 14 at page 96. Yeah, page 96. Yes. Paragraph 4. Do you have that? Yes. There you set out the sources of the information relied upon by you in this affidavit? Yes. Many of those sources are not a matter of great controversy. They may be in certain cases in relation to certain persons, but generally speaking, those are the facts upon which you relied. Would you tell the Chair, please, what you relied on for the preparation of this affidavit? First, uh, as I've indicated in my, in my affidavit, uh, the first being uh, the disciplinary records, because I think uh, the disciplinary process was completed around about that time, uh, 2016. And uh, the, also the, yeah, the findings, as well as uh, the, the SIU findings in, uh, in respect of our communication. Also taking into consideration, Chair, that the, the report of the SIU is the report of the President. However, in the process, we have been working together with the SIU and uh, also getting some information on which made us to rely uh, on this, uh, on, on for us to, 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 sub, to, to compile this motion. But we'll talk about the SIU report in due course briefly, but um, just for the record, Chair, the transcript of the disciplinary hearing uh, relied upon by Ms. McKetsy 
is in bundle FS 16, 17, 18, and 19. The findings are in bundle FS 19 at page 612 to page 788, and the SIU report is in bundle FS 15 at page 384. It's a report dated August 2015. Subject to that, and as far as you are aware, are the facts contained in this affidavit true and correct? Yes. Of course, many of the facts that are contained in this affidavit were summarized in heads of argument, which we also have available, Chair, um, prepared on the basis of the papers by um, Advocate Budlander, and those <coughs> facts were found by the court, uh, Paul A.J., largely to be reliable and correct. Do I understand that correct? Yes. And we'll deal with his judgment in so far as it's relevant in due course. Is that correct? Yes. Now, we've told the Chair that the events relevant to your evidence today, Ms. McKetsy, took place in the 2010-2011 financial year within the Free State Department of Human Settlements. Yes, correct. Who was the head of department of Free State Human Settlements at the time? It was Mr. Mkwena. And who was the MEC for Human Settlements in the Free State Province at the time? It was uh, MEC Zwane. If one could go, please, to paragraph 8. If I may just put that on record. In paragraph 7, just by way of introduction, you say in the affidavit that this application arises from a set of agreements concluded in late 2010 and early 2011 between the department, between the department and a number of building contractors and suppliers of building materials and to payments made by the department to the suppliers. Is that a correct summary of the application? Yes. Or the subject think. matter of the application? Yes. That, and then that. you explain in paragraph 8, the agreements Have relate to the construction of low-cost housing in the Free State Province. The department received a large conditional funding allocation from National Treasury to build low-cost housing. That's a correct statement of fact, I understand. Yes. Uh, do raise your voice, Mr. Mukhesi. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. And the legislation which governed that funding allocation from National Treasury was the applicable Division of Revenue Act, DORA. Is that correct? Correct. You continue in the affidavit to say the agreements form part of a fraudulent scheme which was conceived by the department to disperse very substantial sums of money, mainly to the suppliers, in order to avoid the funds becoming a so-called unspent conditional allocation and therefore reverting to the National Revenue Fund. Uh, is that a correct uh, statement of fact? Yes. Uh, would you explain yeah. it, please, to yeah, the Perhaps also I must also be, be very careful because uh, not everything that looks like fraud is fraud. And, uh, and also to, uh, because the, the, the sole purpose of, of, of this affidavit also taking into consideration that uh, the SIU was also on it, was really to try and pass away the court to, to give us a, 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 a favorable judgment to recover the money. So that's, that was really uh, 
the the whole purpose of of uh, of uh, of this um, court proceeding mm. uh, in mm. the May. Mm. Well, if you, you simply have to describe matters as you believe them, genuinely believe them to be so. If you genuinely believe that this was fraud, that's what you say. Um, it, may be, it may be that you are mistaken, but if that's your genuine belief, that's what you say. Uh, if you don't genuinely believe so, you don't say so. You don't say you believe it to be fraud. If you say it appears to me to be fraudulent, that's what you say. So, so I'm just explaining that because okay. I seem to detect that you think that there may be uh, aspects in the affidavit where maybe you put statements in a certain way and you just want it to be understood in a certain context or Mr. Pretorius may be putting certain propositions to you and you are not sure whether they uh, it's something you can agree to completely or whether you need to qualify it. So I'm just explaining that to you that in the end whatever you say must reflect what you genuinely believe to be the position. Uh, I think what I can say with with uh, utmost commitment it is it is that they were irregular uh, in the, in, the, uh, in that way because uh, in the manner that they were done you know and uh, one cannot conclusively say it is fraud because uh, you know I am advised or also inform that. You know, there must be an element, a proven element of intention uh, as well. It certainly looked like that, uh, but, uh, you know... You are, quite, you are quite entitled to say, this is how it looks to you, or yes. this is how it looked to you at the time. You are quite entitled to say, well, it looked like that at the time, but since then I've had an opportunity to reflect. I don't think it looks like that. So nobody wants you to say something that you don't genuinely believe to be true. Okay. 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 So as Mr. Pretorius puts questions to you, just bear that in mind. Okay. Mr. Pretorius. Well, let's deal with that briefly. We'll get into the detail in due course as to why um, you would have said in this affidavit it was a fraudulent scheme, and it said more than once, uh, Mr. McKenzie, why the judge would have found it um, a fraudulent scheme, and why your counsel uh, presented extensive heads of argument describing the scheme which was fraudulent. That scheme, what was its purpose? It's uh, mainly uh, I think, as as uh, as as you, you have also articulated, it was one meant to spend the money because uh, uh, it came. I, I'm informed that at that particular time, uh, the department, I think, uh, expenditure of the department was around about 10 percent, and there was issues of concern that they will not be in the position to spend uh, the money, the, the full uh, allocation by the end of the year. So uh, it came as a result of that, to try and, and, and uh, spend uh, what has been allocated, because that is also it became clear that... Uh, Is it your analysis of what happened that the purpose was to avoid uh, this money being taken back to National Revenue Fund, to the National Revenue Fund, if it had not been spent by the end of the financial year? 
Yeah, ordinarily it will be re reallocated to other provinces. That's oh. what ordinarily happens. Yes, yeah. So and basically, ordinarily the province would forfeit the, the funds that had not been spent. Yes, a certain portion. A certain portion. And uh, it will be allocated and reallocated to, to, to other provinces. Yes. Uh, who are spending. And, that, and, and that's how normally it works. And uh, what, what, what must happen before the province forfeits such money? What is required to have happened before the province? Could well, uh, such money? there will be reports that are presented mm -hmm. uh, to to for, for all the provinces in terms of where they are, mm -hmm. uh, how much they have spent, uh, mm -hmm. up to a particular point. Normally, after half a year, you are expected at least to be as close as possible to 50 percent. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the projects that are running and the level of commitment that, uh, mm -hmm. that, you, that, that you have. Mm -hmm. And then you are given an opportunity to say, for, particularly for those uh, who are underspending, then you are given an opportunity to make a case as to why uh, your allocation or certain funds should not be taken away from yourselves mm -hmm. and uh, reallocated elsewhere. Would it be correct to say, as a province or as a department, you would forfeit those funds or a portion of those funds if uh, either it's National Treasury or National Department, I don't know which one, concludes that you have failed to spend the funds uh, sufficiently during that financial year for the purpose for which they were allocated to you? You will be correct, uh, would it be correct to say, as a department, you would forfeit such funds or a portion of such funds if either it's the National Treasury or the National Department, I don't know which one you would know, concludes that you as a department have failed to sufficiently spend the funds that were allocated to you for the papers for which they were allocated to you? Yes, you, 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 will, you will forfeit it. Two stages, two, two, you know, the first part is a report provinces that have not spent or that have not reached a specific milestone in the expenditure mm -hmm. will then be identified. You know, it can be one or two, a number of them. Mm -hmm. And those provinces will then have to make a, a sort of a recovery plan, expenditure recovery plan that will indicate Mm -hmm. uh, for example, how you you would be how you would recover, and, uh, and you know be enough. on track be on track with the rest, and that is informed by the projects that are uh, are running, mm -hmm. and uh, with all that information, then the national department will either say no, we, we agree with you, or no, we don't agree with you, and uh, therefore we are taking money anyway yes. and allocate. Uh, you know, yes, it's okay. a question of a discussion between the mm -hmm. relevant province and the national department. Mm -hmm. But in the, in 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 the end, then you are not going to forfeit any money if uh, the national or the national department believes that you are spending the money appropriately. Yes, you will not. If, if they believe, yeah, yeah. if you have made your case... Yeah, uh, you persuade you will, them. Yes. You, uh, but if, they, if, despite whatever you say, they are convinced that you are not spending the money uh, sufficiently... They take it away. They'll, they'll take it away. Yes. Okay. Mr. Pretorius? So, so, so if I want to avoid that that consequence, whatever I do, I would have to create the impression, at least, that I have sufficiently used the money for the purpose for which it was given to me, is it not? Uh, uh, maybe I'm, I'm, misunderstood, I'm misunderstanding your, your, your question. In, in, in other words, if I don't want the National Department 
to conclude that I have not sufficiently used the money for the purpose for which it was given to me. Yes. I would have to create the impression that I have sufficiently used the money for the purpose for which it was given to me during that financial year. Then if, if I persuade them that that is the position, they won't take it away they from me. They must believe in your plan. Hmm? First. They must believe in your plan that you are yes. putting forward. Yes. They yes. have to believe that, yes. that, that uh, in your plan. Yes. If they don't believe in your plan, yeah. they will take the money anyway. Yes. Okay. And how they, how they take the money is that uh, you will not receive your next allocation. For yes. example, if you are receiving uh, uh, just by way 100,000 per mm. month, mm. Uh, which goes to 1.2 million, I'm just making an example. Mm. The last two, they will decide and say, right, you are not going to receive, the, uh, for February and March, you will not receive if yeah. they decide to take 200,000 yes. or 300,000, whatever the case might be. Yeah. So, okay. so that's, how, that's how it works. It works, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Pretorius. Uh, I hope that has clarified <coughs> You've something. Told, I'm sorry, Chair. I'm saying I'm ho I hope that has clarified something. Well, it uh, may need further clarification, <laughs> if I may, Chair. But by all means, continue if you seek to have more clarification. Yes, thank you. You've told the Chair, Mr. McKetty, of the sources that you relied on to prepare this affidavit. Yes, yes. They included the disciplinary <coughs> hearing transcript, the evidence that was given in order to dismiss certain employees of the department, correct? Yes. The findings of the disciplinary hearing which resulted in the dismissal of certain employees, correct? Yes. And the investigation carried out by the Special Investigating Unit, right? Yes. You looked at those documents and you reached certain conclusions which led you on behalf of the department to attest to this affidavit for review, correct? Yes. You say in paragraph eight in this affidavit, the agreements which you seek to set aside form part of a fraudulent scheme which was conceived by the department to disperse very substantial sums of money, mainly to the suppliers, in order to avoid the funds becoming a so-called unspent conditional allocation and therefore reverting to the National Revenue Fund. Now, when you attested to this affidavit, did you believe that to be a correct statement? Yes, I believe Has so. anything happened um, for you to change your mind? Well, uh, to, my, to change my mind, uh, simply that it, it was, un, you know, the process was unlawful. Well, because you know the process was unlawful. We'll go into the detail of that. Okay. You accept the process was unlawful? Yes. Right. And you accept that certain representations had be, to be made to National in order to persuade them not to take your money away, correct? Yes. And many of those representations were not true, correct? Yes. And as a result, um, the law that should have been carried out the forfeiture wasn't carried out, correct? There? Can we repeat that, Mr. Pretorius? In other Forfeit. words, you were required to explain to National why they shouldn't forfeit the money. Yes. Or why okay. you shouldn't forfeit the money. Yes. Explanations were made, documents were put up, statements were made, many of which were false, correct? Yes, many. Yes, we'll many come to the detail. Okay, don't worry. Right. I don't want to uh, hold you to generalizations. Um, we'll come to that. And as a result, what should have happened in accordance with the law didn't happen. The money should have been forfeited, but wasn't. Correct. Yes, the money should have been forfeited because uh, the national department did not accept the expenditure recovery plan of well and on we'll that, come to on that, that expenditure basis recovery you plan the money because that in itself is a gross misrepresentation but we'll come to that and you say so yourself so i'm not uh, um, taking things further than 
what you say in this affidavit. Okay. But let, let's move on, if we may, because it's all in the detail. You say it was a fraudulent scheme in your affidavit. You say it again in paragraph 10. You say the agreements and payments form part of a fraudulent scheme and are tainted by fraud. You say that yourself. Correct. It's not just a passing comment in one paragraph. You say it repeatedly throughout. Yes. Correct. Were you in court when your counsel argued the matter? No, I was not in court. Well, let me just tell you that your counsel argued strenuously that the scheme was a fraudulent scheme. Did you take note of the judgment of the court? Yes, I've, I've seen the judgment. If I can just take you to FS 14 at page 599. That's right at the end of the bundle. Did you say 599? Yes. Okay. Paragraph 9. You would have read this and no doubt accepted the finding because you acted on it. If you look at paragraph 9 on page 602. This is the judgment of the court. Court was presided over by Lopser J and Paul A J. The matter was heard on the twenty sixth of August twenty nineteen, according to this, even though the application was brought three years prior to that. The judgment was delivered on the 26th of August 2019. And in paragraph 9, the following is said, and I'm referring to page 602. The department was not able to spend the funding referred to in paragraph 6 supra. Fast enough and within the fiscal year to avoid the situation that most of it would revert back to the national revenue fund in terms of DORA. You've already told the chair about that. The judgment continues to read, the department therefore conceived an illegal scheme to facilitate the advance payment of very substantial amounts of money, mainly to suppliers within the fiscal year so that the funds would not revert back to the National Treasury Fund. Judgment continues. The agreements that form the subject matter of this application were a key part of this illegal scheme. The agreements were unlawful for two major reasons. They were concluded without any proper procurement process having been followed. And the agreements and the payments made under them form part of a fraudulent scheme to avoid the consequences of Dora. Mm. That is the finding of the court. And it continues in paragraph 10, this illegal scheme was devised to allow the department to pay material suppliers very significant sums of money over a short period of time, in total more than 630 million rand over the period 2010 to 2011. That's the judgment that arose and was granted, or the relief was granted in accordance with the application that you brought. Now, if we could go back if, to page 10, uh, so page 98 of the bundle, paragraph 10.
Yeah, page 98. Page 98, paragraph 10. There your affidavit reads, there are two major grounds on which the department seeks its relief. The first is that the agreements were concluded and the payments were made in breach of procurement law. Mm -hmm. The second is that the agreements and payments form part of a fraudulent scheme and are tainted by fraud. That, those observations there in paragraph 10 are mirrored in the judgment and the portion I've just read, correct? Correct. Let's go to the components of the scheme, if we may, in paragraph 22 of your affidavit. <clears throat> Once again, you make reference in paragraph 22 to a fraudulent scheme, and if I can just read what you say in paragraph 22. I have said that this application relates to a set of agreements which the department concluded in late 2010 and early 2011 with contractors and suppliers. I have also said that the agreements form part of a fraudulent scheme conceived by the department to pay out funds from its conditional funding allocation in order to avoid the funds becoming an unspent conditional allocation and reverting to the National Revenue Fund. That's at least the third reference to a fraudulent scheme. Doesn't seem to have been an error on your part. Correct. Yes. And then you describe the major features of the scheme in paragraph 23. You say firstly that the department concluded some 125 written building contracts with contractors. Uh, are you able to say when those were concluded? That was before the prepayments were made to suppliers, is that correct? Yes, yeah. And what did those building contracts provide in relation to who would purchase materials, supply materials, and who would pay for them? Yeah. <coughs> the the con the con you know it's a it's a standard contract supplier has, uh, the contractor is responsible to purchase material and uh, also to to build convert that material into a product product referring to different milestone whether it is um, foundation wall plates or completions and then upon that, uh, then the contractor will then, if he has completed the first milestone, like the foundation, uh, P5.1, he can then claim. Right. That's the basis. That's the contract. Uh, the basis of, the, yes. of, that, of that contract. Now, these are standard building contracts that comply with the regulatory framework applicable to construction. Correct. 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 Um, what is important about that scheme that you've just described is that the contractor sources the materials in yes. accordance with the needs of the contractor. Yes. The contractor can then certify that those have been delivered. Is that correct? Yes. That's it. And yes. the contractor then incorporates those materials, such as they are, into the building. The <coughs> The normal contract is the, the, the contractor. Uh, you, you, if I didn't understand your question, you can. The normal, the normal is that the contractor is responsible for procuring material. That's basically uh, how it works. And he must convert that material into a product, the foundation. And then he must, uh, once he has completed the, 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 the foundation, that's the first milestone. He then can claim that foundation subject to the certification and the signing off by the engineer and so on. Yeah, of course. So that's, that's the normal, normal yeah. process. So the process you've described has a number of checks and balances in it. Yes. Uh, that can put the 
client, the Department of Human Settlements, in a position of some comfort that materials have been ordered, supplied, incorporated into the building and then certified to have been so placed in the building, correct? Yes. We don't buy material, we buy a complete product. Yes, well, um, however we describe them. Um, but in the normal course and in terms of the contracts that you entered into or the department entered into with the uh, contractors, the builders, that was the scheme that was to be followed. Am I correct? Yes. Correct. Right. But then further agreements were entered into. By the way, it will become clear later that even those contractors were not appointed in accordance with a proper procurement scheme. You say that later, is that correct? Yes. We'll just flag that for the moment and deal with it later. But then further agreements were entered into. You say in paragraph 23.2 that despite the supply of materials or or whatever um, being dealt with in the contracts with the builders or the contractors, further agreements were entered into. The department, you say in paragraph 23.2, also concluded some 112 written tripartite supply agreements with contractors and building material suppliers. A material term of these supply agreements was that the department would pay suppliers for building materials which the suppliers supplied to contractors. So now instead of the original scheme that you've just described to the chair taking place, we have a different scheme. Is that correct? Which differs entirely from the first scheme. From the first, yes. Right? So here, the department was going to, play, to pay the suppliers for the building materials which the suppliers would then supply to the contractors, correct? Yes. Why was it necessary to do that? It was not necessary. I don't know why it was necessary at the time. You to do you know, Mr. McKitts? <laughs> Because you say so. But anyway, would you just tell the chair, please? Look, the, I could help you if you like, the, but I don't want to lead you on it. Yeah. The, the, the first, there was the second, uh, what is it, the material supply agreements that were entered into with, uh, I think it says, 112 uh, agreements. Now this 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 uh, material supplier uh, will then supply uh, materials uh, to the contractor, which in a way contradicts the first part because uh, the responsibility to 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 of of, of acquiring material. It's not the responsibility of the department, it's the responsibility of the contractor. We are simply saying uh, so that the contractor can at a later stage claim. Now, here we have an instance where uh, it now becomes the responsibility. That which is the responsibility of the contractor becomes the responsibility of, of, uh, of the department. And, uh, and, and, and this is where part of the problem also uh, okay. also is but uh, it can only mean that uh, you know by, by by acquiring material then you show a better expenditure uh, uh, per se so that's that, that's 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 basically well let's let's explain it because it is important and it's fundamental to the substance of your affidavit and what happened afterwards, Mr. McKenzie. If one goes back to the original scheme, the way it was originally planned to happen in the normal course, the contractor enters into a contract with the department to build a house. Yes. 
It's the contractor's responsibility to source the materials yes. and to use them in the, in house, the house and to pay yes. the supplier. Correct. There are three stages, three milestones. The first milestone is the foundation. Correct. The second is the wall plate. The walls of the building. Yes. Correct. And the third is the roofing. Yes. At the completion of each stage, once the work has been checked and verified, the contractor can then claim the money from the department, and the department will pay if everything is in order. Yes. And included in those charges that the contractor uh, bills the department with is the materials that it has bought. Yes. Correct. Yes. Now, if the house hasn't been built yet, this would only happen sometime in the future. Correct. Yes. Only, that money would only be paid when the foundations are built, or when the wall is built. Correct. Yes. But the department had to find a way of spending money quickly. Correct. In order to avoid its reversion to the fiscus. Correct. Yes. And so the scheme was devised to make sure that money could be spent before the year end. Is that correct? Yes. You say as much. Yes. Uh, please, I'm, I'm not putting words in your mouth. Um, and it was done through a device, a series of agreements, which, as you yourself say, made very little sense. And let's go into the detail then. Um, in paragraph 23.2, a second set of agreements, the tripartite supply agreements, 112 agreements, were entered into, and in terms of those agreements, it was agreed the department would pay the suppliers for building materials, which were to be supplied or were supplied to the contractors, correct? Yes. Even before the foundation was built, even before the walls were built, and especially even before the roof was put on, correct? Correct. Then there was a third set of agreements, and these are the so-called session agreements, uh, sometimes spelt with a C, sometimes spelt with four S's instead of just three. Um, now, do you know what these agreements were? Session. We try and explain them to the Czech because it is quite complicated. Yeah. The, what gives rise to a, a session is, you know, you cede your claim to a third party. Now, uh, there cannot be a cause for payment if there is no claim. Now, uh, and, and, and this is also a, a, a part of the problem because uh, in that particular process, you know, the, there was no claim or cause for, for uh, 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 or cause for 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 payment against uh, a claim because there was no claim to be ceded uh, in the first instances because uh, all these three agreements, in my view, contradicted each other. You know, it did, it did not make sense on on. On one process. Let's uh, try and explain sorry. that um, in a way that those who are following the evidence can understand because it's elusive. You've told the chair that the contractor would have a claim against the department once the foundations were set, or once the walls had been built, or once the roof had been put on. Yes. Of course, when these session agreements were entered into, that hadn't been done. Correct. Yeah, there was no foundation. There was no not claim. Yes. So at that stage, when these session agreements were entered into, in other words, when the claim of the contractor was given to the supplier, that's the session, there was no claim because the house hadn't been built. Correct. Correct. So at that stage, the contractor had no claim to cede, correct? Yes. But nevertheless entered into a session agreement, 
giving its claim against the department to the supplier for the materials, correct? Yes. At a time when no such claim existed. Yes. Correct. And even later, of course, there would be no claim to see because the suppliers would already have been paid. Uh, yes. So there were problems with this uh, session, not so. As yes, you said, no, this was part of the problem. Correct. Yes. But as you point out later in the affidavit, these very sessions were used as part of the documentation given to Provincial Treasury to persuade them to pay. Correct? Yes. Is that correct? Anyway, um, prior to the claim of the contractors even arising, um, and pursuant to the sessions, the department made payments to the suppliers in excess of 500 million rand. Correct. Correct. And you say in paragraph 23.5, as you've just said to the chair, there was no lawful cause for the payments. Correct? Now that's a general statement because, of course, some materials might have been delivered and some not. Yes. But the detail of that would depend on the detailed investigations being done by various bodies in relation to particular contracts, and we are not going there in this hearing. Is that, mm. Do, it, do yes. I understand the position correctly? Yes. Right. But in 23.6 you say, the tripartite supply agreements between the department and the suppliers and the contractors did not give rise to a cause for the payments because the suppliers had not supplied materials to the contractors before being paid. And that was correct as far as you were concerned at the as time. As far as I'm concerned at the time, it was, that was correct. Yes. You continue to say the payment structure in the supply agreements requiring supply before payment was not followed. The invoicing and certification requirements in the supply agreements were not complied with. Correct? Correct. Now, <clears throat> just to get back to the fraud. Nowhere in the documentation, uh, and in fact the contrary appears, does it appear that uh, the Free State Department said to National, listen, don't take our money back. Uh, because we are going to spend it in this way, uh, but we must warn you that it's completely irregular, and we must warn you that these requirements are not uh, being followed, and they are all prepayments. Nowhere was National told that, correct? Yeah, no. Correct? Correct. Am I correct? Yes. Um, then in paragraph 23.7, you deal with the sessions. You say, nor did the sessions of claims by the contractors to the suppliers give rise to a cause for payments. This is because the claims which were purportedly ceded, that is, claims by the contractors against the department, had not yet arisen. You've just told the chair that. Is that right? Yes. The contractors had not executed the construction works or portions of the construction works, nor had they provided materials to the department. The contractors did therefore the contractors therefore did not have claims for payment against the department. Um, you've told the chair that. Yes. And I take it nobody told National in writing or otherwise, look, there's a problem with all these contracts. Um, because we're prepaying and nothing has been done and the sessions really aren't worth the paper they're written on. Correct? Correct. Nobody told National no, that? No. So you say in paragraph 23.8, the department nonetheless paid more than 500 million rand to various suppliers over the course of 2009 to 2011. It did so purportedly on the strength of the session agreements. In other words, department officials used the deeds of session as the paperwork justifying the instruction to their accounting staff to pay out. Department officials also manipulated the housing subsidy system to make it look 
as if construction work had been executed and that payments were therefore due, when in truth this was not the case. Those are correct statements of fact, are they? Yes. So not only were the, were the sessions that uh, ceded claims that didn't exist or purported to cede claims that didn't exist used to persuade the part to used to persuade accounting staff to pay out. Um, but the, it's a complicated uh, arrangement that was entered into. But milestones were inserted into the agreements, correct? Uh, yes. And those milestones really uh, w weren't regularly inserted. And yes. I don't want to go into the detail now. If necessary, we could go later. Correct. But the system was unlawfully or irregularly manipulated to put a milestone in the agreement which didn't really exist. Yes. Well, I, I asked you earlier, um, Mr. McKessie, why the department implemented this scheme, which was clearly irregular, deceptive, and in your own words, fraudulent. And you deal with that at paragraph 24 and following. Um, if you could just tell the chair, please, um, in your own words, why, what the reason was for the scheme to be implemented. Well, uh, chair, uh, I think it's simple. The reason why it, it, it went this way, it was to ensure that uh, you know the department does not lose money back to the fiscals and and therefore to other provinces. So uh, acquisition of material or, or, or paying of or, or buying material uh, resulted in this particular type of a process or scheme. That was in the main. Uh, why uh, it, it when it was because uh, you know there, there was a possibly possible loss uh, to other provinces of uh, of the money or of the conditional grant right in other words it was necessary to persuade the national department of human settlements and national treasury to do what they would not have done had they known the true facts, correct? Yeah. You say yes? Yes. And you say um, that there was a threat that the unspent allocation would revert to National Revenue Fund, you say, say that in 24.2, to be reallocated to provinces with better spending records. And then in paragraph 24.3, you say in the face of that threat, the department proceeded to implement the scheme, dispersing funds to the tune of more than 500 million rand from its conditional allocation with no lawful cause for the payments to be made. Now, <clears throat> the department faced a difficulty. You have literally hundreds of contractors and over a hundred suppliers, each with their own arrangements. Uh, in relation to the supply of materials and its dealings with the department, correct? Yes. Were you able at this time to do sufficient investigation to examine each and every contract? All the hundred and... Yes. It was extremely difficult. Right. You appointed several investigators to do that, correct? Yeah, it, internally so, we could not do it. Yes, and we have examples of what happened. Yes. For example, examples of charges being levied against the department with nothing being delivered. Yes, correct. we have examples of that. Yes, and, and fraudulent uh, charges, correct? Yes. But in paragraph 26, you make an estimate, which I think is worth putting before the uh, chair. What, what do you say there in paragraph 26? Yeah. 
You wanted me to read it out? Well, uh, oh. you can read it if you like. Um, let, let's just establish that you signed this affidavit uh, in 2016, correct? Yes. By that time, had all these houses been built? No, not, no, not, not all. Not all is, right, that's yeah. five years later, Sorry. let alone in 2010, 2011. It is? Sorry, five years later, not all the houses were built. Not all the houses were built. In 2010, 2011, how many of the houses had been built? 2010, 11. Virtually none. Well, I don't know. Well, all right. the reports will tell us uh, yeah. what had been done. That's not a matter of great controversy. Yeah. But the point is, uh, you had spent, in advance of the building of the houses, something like 600 million rand. Okay. Yes. Correct. All right. But you say here, the department has, however, obtained reports which indicate how much more it will cost to procure that the housing which the contractors were contracted to build, the 14,769 units to which I referred to above, is built. It will cost the department an estimated further approximately 500 million rand. Then you say the calculation is not straightforward, but the department's best estimate is that it has lost approximately 400 Million. 866,000 million rand. That was your best estimate at the that time? Not, yes. Nearly uh, half a billion rand. Not yes. Lost. 400 million, 866,000. I don't know if you got the number right. Do you want to? 400 you may million, have got it right. Yeah, 866,000. 400 million, 866,000. Yes. Yeah, okay. You may have got it right uh, first time around. I might have just had something else. Well, I could easily have got it wrong, Chair. Yeah. Um, let's just say that almost half a billion rand was spent before anything was done. Okay. More yes. than half a billion rand. And the ultimate loss to the department was in the region of half a billion rand. The ultimate, yeah, 400 and... Yes. Yeah, so, and this is in relation to building house, houses for people who need houses to be built to live in. It's for low-cost housing, correct? Yes, this is for low-cost housing. That's what the money should have been spent on. Yes, this is for low-cost housing. So this money that was paid out to contractors um, about... Uh, It, it, about uh, about five hundred about five hundred uh, million was paid out. Is it right? And then, but you say the loss is four hundred million eight hundred and sixty-six. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, chair uh, is. I think the estimate is. Yeah, the equivalent number of houses. Yeah. How much yeah. is it going to cost? Yes. The uh, the department to build. Right? Yes. That's why the five hundred million. Yes, and then but the also actual amount that was paid out would be is how no, much? No, we are not there. Okay, the actual amount that was paid out, I think... Uh, we haven't dealt with that, I thought yeah. we had. But I think what is being tried to be explained here is that the, um, the houses that were supposed to be built at that part, the 14,706, this is the estimate. Of yes. how much it will cost, 500 million. Yes. But already we had made advance payments. Yes. And, and that 408, million uh, is probably uh, what has not been accounted for in respect of the advance payments that were made. Because yes. it's not in all instances where material were not delivered and houses were not built. Yes. There are instances, there are houses that yes. have been, but as to the extent of the value that we have received, it was yes. a problem to say, uh, and that's why we had also had to uh, 
I think we did two actions. One, uh, as they say, is uh, before the review application, the action proceedings, just to force the contractors to give us invoices, delivery notes, and so on and so on. But as things presently stood at the time of your affidavit, and I guess maybe even now, but certainly at that time, your estimate was that the department has lost, had lost more than 400 million rand. Yeah, we could not properly know. Be accounted for. Accounted for as to, yes. as to uh, because yes. of uh, this particular. But money concept. had been paid out to people. Some houses yes. had been built. Some But not. when some were not, and it looks like there were many which, which were not. Yes. And your estimate was the department had lost more than 400 million rand. Yeah. Which okay. might well have changed over time. Yes. But uh, at that time, when you deposed the, to the affidavit, yes. that was your estimate. Because I'm aware of, uh, even though I'm not exactly sure about the amounts mm. that were recovered by, by the SIU yeah. in the yeah. process. Okay. But by whatever account, it was substantial amounts yes. that were not accounted for. Correct. Okay. Well, we know that, and Chair, the figures vary um, by 100 million rand at times, but we know from your affidavit that approximate, well, more than 500 million rand was spent as part of this scheme, this irregular scheme of prepayments to suppliers. That, that much we know, correct? Yes. We know that there are examples, and these examples emerge from the various investigations that have taken place of unqualified builders just walking off site, and that money being therefore lost, correct? Correct. Um, and there are many other examples of losses. But the first point is that these, this unlawful, irregular scheme of prepayments, uh, and we'll describe it yet again in your own words in a moment, um, cost the department in the Free State over 500 million rand. Correct. You then... I just make sure, Mr. Mukherjee, yes. your response is... Yes. Shut, yeah. yes. You then did an investigation and you estimated how much more have we got to spend uh, in order to complete the building of these houses. And you say that that would have been over 500 million yeah. rand. You say that in paragraph 26. Of course, an estimate. Yes, it's an correct. estimate. And you say in the last sentence, the calculation is not straightforward. But the department's best estimate, and that is best estimate in 2016, is that it has lost approximately 400 million 866,000 rand. Correct. Yes. Substantial amount of money. Now, at 50,000 rand per house, I've just been told by someone who's done the calculation, that could have built over 8,000 houses. That's a substantial amount of money yeah. in, in, on any calculation. Now, of course, as you point out that this was difficult to establish because you've got hundreds of contracts, hundreds of transactions, each one different in its own way, many fraudulent, many uh, suppliers didn't supply, many claims were overstated, but it's a massive job to investigate each and every single contract, and that you've employed people to do. Yes. Then in paragraph 27, if we may go there, you made a submission. You said, I submit that the department's scheme was a fraud on the national government, specifically on the fiscus. It was also a fraud on the public, on all who expect state funds to be spent regularly or properly, including on improving the standard of living of the poor, on those in the free state and in other provinces with an expectation of receiving state-funded housing and on all taxpayers. That, I understand, was your belief at the time. Yes. Anything to change your mind? 
No, not really. Not really. Then in paragraph 28 you say, I have described the above, I have described above the fraudulent aspects of the department scheme. It is important to point out that the contracts were also unlawful because the department did not follow any, un any lawful procurement process before concluding them. This is in itself a ground on which the contract should be declared void. Uh, in case we haven't made it clear already, uh, Mr. McKetsy, the selection of the suppliers to which payments were made will come in due course to how those people were selected, perhaps not in your evidence, but in the evidence of witnesses to come. But what we do know, there was no open tender and bidding process that preceded the appointment of suppliers. We know that as a fact, correct? Yes. You give the factual background, and it's not necessary to go into too much detail here, Mr. McKetsy, because we've dealt with it um, in some respects already. But what was the, it, it's in paragraph 30 and following of your affidavit at page 105 and following of FS 14. What was the breaking new ground project of the cabinet in s announced in September 2004? Uh, sustainable, sustainable human settlements. Um. Yeah, it was a comprehensive plan for the development of sustainable human settlements, correct? Yes. Uh, which included the building of houses. It included a billion of houses, and uh, it's, it's, it's a whole comprehensive plan. The infrastructure you know, it's required. Not infrastructure, building uh, houses, amenities, social amenities, yes. uh, and so on. Not only about houses, but also to understand that uh, when you, when you, when, when, when you, when you, and, and that's why the change from, from housing to human settlements, because then it takes into consideration uh, the entire uh, the entire community. community, whether it be social amenities, infrastructure, and so on, as we've indicated. So That's this was a about. comprehensive and ambitious plan to provide sustainable human settlements for poor people. Yes. Right. And you say in the last sentence in paragraph 30, among the ways it tries to achieve that aim are easing delivery constraints, increasing building capacity, and rooting out corruption and maladministration. At least that was the intent. Correct? Correct. Then in paragraph 31 and following, uh, you set out certain facts, um, and it's necessary to deal with those in paragraph 32. Um, you say, in pursuance of this scheme, the Breaking New Ground Low-Cost Housing Project Scheme, funds are allocated in terms of the Division of Revenue Act to provinces each year. Mm. Yes. You've told the Chair that. But paragraph 32 is important. That allocation, you say in paragraph 32, is a specific purpose and conditional allocation. In other words, a province receiving funds is not unconstrained in how it spends those funds. In other words, when the money is allocated to you by National Treasury in terms of DORA, that's the Division of Revenue Act, is the province free to spend it as it likes? No. Um, you, you have to spend it uh, first, yeah, you know, in terms of the housing code, where you can spend it, and uh, in terms of the approved business plan. 
So right. you can't just bend it. Right. There's a housing way. code that governs that the governs the that governs yeah to make sure that you fall within the policy framework, and also uh, of course uh, the business plan also uh, approved by the national department and then determines what how you're going to spend money where and in what area. Now, we know um, in relation to the business plan that uh, national, the national department under Minister Sokwali at the time said, you must give me a plan, uh, otherwise this money is going to be lost to the province. And that was the expenditure recovery, recovery plan. plan. We'll come to that in a moment because that was a representation to national uh, which uh, we will see was completely misleading. But let's first deal with the points you make in 32.1 to 32.3, Mr. McKenzie. The money is given to the province. The province obviously has to disperse that money to contractors to and to other parties, um, people who build infrastructure and the like, uh, advisors and the like. Um, those are third parties. Yes. Now, in relation to third parties, what are the restrictions in the Division of Revenue Act? You deal with those in 32.1 to 32.3. Those are important for the purposes of this evidence. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, there is a standard way of when money is allocated. You must spend it on the approved business plan and approved projects. They will have been identified which projects are there. You, you also, you should have planned before. You know, you don't do your planning in the year that you're supposed to implement. The planning uh, implementation precedes planning. And uh, those particular projects that you are going to spend the money on will have then be pre-approved uh, through a process before uh, you, you know before we start uh, the financial uh, financial year, and you know that's how the process works in terms of different progress programs within you know we infrastructure and 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 uh, and as well as uh, housing. So you would tell National how you're going to spend the money, they would then give you the money, you would be obliged to spend it in accordance with those plans? With those particular plans. And you will also have an opportunity halfway, you know, through, uh, say, through half, half, half yearly to either revise your business plan because certain projects are not performing as they should. And that becomes a matter of discussions. Right. Yeah. Uh, but at all financial. times, but. the way that the allocation is managed in terms of the Division of Revenue Act is that there must be complete transparency between the provincial department and, and the, the national. national department yes. and treasury. Correct. Correct. They must be informed exactly what is being done with that money. Correct. Correct. Right. And in relation to payments to third parties, for example, contractors, uh, there are special restrictions in the Act, am I correct? Yes. The first is that the province must have entered into a payment schedule with a third party. In other words, there must be a schedule which says precisely when and how much must be paid to the third party and on what performance, correct? Yes, it's based on your contractual arrangement between yourself uh, you know, if it is, obviously, if it is houses, uh, that payment schedule will be per milestones, okay. uh, et cetera. As, as per the contract, the as first contract, the contract that we spoke about with the contract. Yes. But that didn't exist with the suppliers. No, it didn't. And only, then only in so far as what we have seen as material supply yes. agreements, which I think well, are problematic. Well, you make more explicit statements later, but we'll come to that. Paragraph 32.2, the payment must be for services rendered by or goods received from the third party. That's the first thing. Yes. 
Services must have been performed and the goods must have been received. Yes. No prepayments. Yes. And those services there's, there's, or goods yeah. must have been properly procured in accordance with supply chain management requirements. In other words, you can't spend a DORA allocation unless you spend it in accordance with a proper supply chain management process. Correct. Yes. And we know that in relation to contractors and suppliers in this case, those simply didn't exist. That didn't happen. Correct. Yes. And then 32.3, advanced payments to third parties, i.e. where services have not yet been rendered or the goods not yet delivered are subject to specific requirements, including the approval by National Treasury. So before the province can make any prepayment, you've got to tell National Treasury and get their permission. Correct. Yeah, there, there is a framework that, 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 uh, that clearly indicates how prepayments are to be done, yes. and they must be part of the contract. First and foremost. Yes, and that didn't happen in this case. No. Well, certainly approval by National Treasury was not obtained. Yeah, I think you, 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 you don't necessarily need uh, approval of National Treasury, but the framework has been laid by National Treasury mm -hmm. that this is how, uh, you know. Well, um, firstly, uh, you say here that one of the specific requirements includes approval by National Treasury. I must say, on our understanding of the law, that's correct. That statement is correct. That's well, it, it, it is correct three. because National Treasury has laid out the framework. I'm saying that is in 30, paragraph 32.3 of the Yes. Yes. Uh, National Treasury has laid out the framework under which you can make advance payments. Mm -hmm. right. That framework is there. Uh, and in terms of treasury regulation. So, uh, are, you, are you saying in other words yeah. that by putting up or prescribing that framework, National Treasury has given approval that provided you act within this framework, then yes. you have our approval? Yes. That's, that's what that's, that's, it yes. means? Yes. Okay. If, if, if it, it's, it, it, it's prescribed, you can't move outside that particular yes. framework. Yes. So, so, <clears throat> so, in other words, what you are saying is uh, it might not, you might not be required to obtain separate or specific approval from National Treasury provided you have acted within that, that framework, framework that National Treasury has approved. Yes. If there is, if for some other reason there is any, because of circumstances or whatever the case might be, uh, you, you are unable to... Uh, comply with the framework. comply with the framework because of good reasons that might be there. Yeah. Then you'll have to go back to National Treasury and make your case. Oh, okay. Mr. Pretorius. All right. So what you're saying in paragraph 32.3, you now say must be qualified yeah, by yeah. the words or the framework. and mm. compliance with the framework yes, that laid down by the National Treasury. Yes, there All is right. a framework. We'll look at that and I'll come back to you on that because uh, the evidence of... Uh, persons from national at the disciplinary inquiry was somewhat different, but let's not uh, deal with that now. I'll come back to that. Okay. You say in paragraph 33, clearly, if a conditional allocation has not been spent by the end of the financial year, it reverts to and must be repaid to the National Revenue Fund. That we've established, right? Mm. Then you say in paragraph 34, for the third or fourth time now, the agreements at issue in this application form part of a fraudulent scheme contrived by the department and the respondents to circumvent the provisions of DORA and avoid the department's unspent conditional housing allocation reverting to the National Revenue Fund. 
Um, do I understand it that you believe that to be true and correct at the time? Yes. And nothing has happened to change your mind? Yes. Correct. Um, well, it's important, Mr. Mukherjee, that you, your answer particularly to that question be had because I think that uh, some, somewhere much earlier, anybody listening might have thought you, have, you had second thoughts about describing the scheme as fraudulent. So I'm just saying, well, to I, the extent that you say nothing has changed your mind, it's important that yeah, that I think comes out clearly. Okay. No, I, uh, I think you have clarified for yes. me, Chair, earlier on. Yes. To say whether I believed. Yes. It's not that it actually yes. is. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, and that, yeah. to me, gives me That's still your comf belief. comfort yeah. because I'm not competent yes. to say something is, yeah. is fraud or not. But yeah. if it looks like fraud, it doesn't mean that it is fraud. Yeah. Okay, uh, no, that's fine. Know. So, yeah. Well, let's, um, because that's a qualification that you haven't placed before the chair before in very clear terms in answer to my questions, and perhaps I should be fair to you to allow you an opportunity to explain. You've said not once, but several times in this affidavit that the scheme was fraudulent, right? We will go into the detail uh, provided by you to show that it was, in fact, fraudulent. We can leave that for the moment, but we, okay. we're dealing with a conclusion that you reached here, right? At the time, I take it, because this is a statement on oath, that you believed it was fraudulent on all the research that you had done, correct? Y yes. Can you now give any reason why it wasn't fraudulent? I say I believe that it was uh, fraudulent. I, and I think I've said, I cannot say with, uh, let me put it this way, I believe it was fraudulent. Correct. Okay, yeah. And uh, I think the chair has, 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 has sort of indicated to me to say, the fact that you believe does not necessarily mean it was. Now the chair has, suggested nothing to you, uh, no. Mr. McKenzie. This is your evidence. I don't the think you... made no you, suggestion I, of any sort of that to you. All the chair what, what, said to what, what you was that you're free say? to give evidence as you now believe to be the case. I said, I said so. I said I believe that it was, at the time, I believe that it was, it was, a, it was a fraudulent uh, at the time. And I still believe that it is. And you still believe so? I still believe that it is. Great. Also. All right. And there's, there's, there's been no revelation to you um, outside of the reports that you referred to earlier that would persuade you that you were completely wrong or partially wrong. Correct. No new information has come to your attention. Oh, hey, no new information has come to my attention, yes. Is that correct? Yes. All right, let's just go, please, if you would, to paragraph 35 of your affidavit on page 107. And uh, what page? 107. 107, Chair. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 35. The total allocation, however it is made up, we needn't go into that detail for present purposes, for housing in the free state for the 2010-2011 year was 1.42 billion rand. Substantial where, amount of where money. Are you read, where are you ready? Or oh, 35, or oh, the last person. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. No, I was saying where are you read, from? Paragraph, paragraph 35, 35, second last line. Okay. Yes? 
Correct. And the plan was during the course of 2010-2011 and 2011-2012 to build 21,050 low-cost houses, apart from everything else that you've just mentioned. Correct. Mm. Is that correct? Yes. You see that in paragraph 36, third last line. Okay, yes. Yes, I see it. Correct. Now, um, we know that wasn't achieved. The extent to which it wasn't achieved is the subject of investigations, correct? Yes. Then in paragraph 37, you give the detail of what we've summarized for the chair earlier, that the 2010-2011 financial year ended on 31 March 2011. By late 2010, it was very clear that the department would not be able to spend the breaking new ground allocation or even a meaningful portion of the allocation by the end of the financial year. Correct? Yes. Now, there were several things that happened to cause the delay in spending. Uh, one of them was that the plans for the sizes of the houses were changed. Correct. You had contracts, or the department had contracts to build 40 square meter houses. The idea was changed to build 50 square meter houses, and <clears throat> a number of contractual, contractual disputes arose. You say that in paragraph 38, correct? Yes. And you say in paragraph 39, in addition, a tender which the department had put out in early 2010 for the construction of low-cost houses lapsed and was cancelled, as I explain more fully below. Now, those circumstances, uh, Mr. McKessie, preceded the prepayment scheme. Yes. And you describe it fully later on. And we believe it's important as a legal team to go through that in some detail, because the whole housing arrangement in the province from the very beginning, from the appointment of the contractors right through to the prepayment to suppliers at the end of the financial year, was uh, completely irregular, with the result that the housing scheme in the department was to put it at its lowest a total failure. And it's important to place that context before the chair because that context hasn't really been given any prominence uh, in material to date. So that's something new that we could put on the table for the chair. Chair, could we do that after the adjournment? Yes, we can do that after lunch. We'll take the lunch adjournment now and resume at 2 o'clock. We adjourn. All rise.